Section 1 of The Maker of Rainbows This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ron Altman The Maker of Rainbows by Richard Legallion Section 1 The Old Coat of Dreams a prologue people in london not merely literary folk but even those higher social circles to which a certain publisher whose name or race it is hardly fair to mention had so obsequiously climbed often wondered whence had come the wealth that enabled him to maintain such an establishment give such elaborate parties have so many automobiles, and generally make all that display which is so convincing to the modern mind. Of course they were not seriously concerned, because so long as it is a party, and the chef is paid so much, and the wines are as old as they should be, not even the rarest blossom on the most ancient and distinguished genealogical tree cares whose party it is, or indeed with whom she dances. There is only one democracy, and that is controlled by gentlemen with names that hardly sound beautiful enough to mention in fairy tales. That democracy of money, to which the fairest flower of our aristocracy now bows her coroneted head. Strange, but we all know that is so it is. Therefore all sorts of distinguished and beautiful people came to the publishers' parties. It would have made no difference really to their hard hearts, could they have known where all the champagne and conservatories and music came from. They would have gone on dancing all the same, and eating pâté de foie gras and sherbets, yet it may interest a sad heart here and there to know how it was that that publisher whose name I forget, but whose nose I can never forget, was able to pay for all that music and dancing, strange flowers, and enchanted food, none of which he, of course, understood. Aristocrats in London, of course, know nothing of a northern district of New York City called Harlem, with so many streets that a learned arithmetician would be needed to number them a district which at the first call of spring becomes vocal with children on doorsteps and vendors of every vegetable in every language in this district too you hear strange trumpets blow announcing knife and scissors grinders and strange bells ringing from strings suspended across carts whose merchandise is bottles and old newspapers you will hear, too, just when the indomitable sweet smells from the terrible eternal spring are blowing in at your window, and the murmur of rich happy people going away is heard in the land, a raucous cry in the hot street, a cry full of melancholy, even despair. It goes something like this, Cash claw! Cash claw! Well, it was just then that a young poet, living in one of those highly arithmetical streets, was wondering, as all the sad spring murmur came to his ears, how he could possibly buy a rose for the bosom of his sweetheart, with whom he was to dance that night at a local ball. Everything he had in the world had gone. He had sold everything, except his poems. All his precious books had gone sad one by one. Little paintings that once made his walls seem like the Louvre had gone. All his old silver spoons, and all the little intaglios he loved so well. And yes, he had even sold the old copper chest of the Renaissance, all studded nails with three locks, in which, well, all had gone. Only where was that rose for the bosom of his sweetheart? Where was it 
growing? Where and how was it to be bought? Just as he was at his wit's end, he heard a cry through the window. It had meant nothing to him before. Now, strange as it may sound, it meant a rose. Cash claw! Cash claw! He had an old dress suit in his wardrobe. Perhaps that would buy a rose. So, leaning through the window, he called down to the voice to come up. The gentleman from Palestine came up. It would be easy to describe the contempt with which he surveyed the distinguished, though somewhat ancient, garments thus offered to him in exchange for a rose. How he affected to examine linings and seams, knowing all the time the distinguished tailor that had made them, and what a bargain he was about to drive. Of course, they weren't, well, really, practically, they weren't worth buying. The poet wondered a moment about the cost of a rose. Are they worth the price of a rose? he asked. The gentleman from Palestine didn't, of course, understand. You see, said he finally, I'd like to give you more, but you know how it is. Look at these linings and buttonholes. Honestly, I don't really care about them at all, but really a dollar and a half is the best I can do on them. And he eyed the poet's clothes with contempt. A dollar seventy-five, said the poet, standing firm. All right, at last, said the gentleman from Palestine. But I don't see where I am to make any profit. However, and he handed out the small, dirty money. Then the poet, bowed him out gently, saying in his heart, Now I can buy my rose. When the Palestinian dealer in old dress suits went home, after sadly leaving behind him that dollar seventy-five, he made an astounding discovery. In the necessary process of re-examining the goods, something fell out of one of the pockets something the poet, after his nature, had quite forgotten. The old clothes man, now a publisher, picked them up from the floor and gazed at them in delight. The poet, in his grandiose carelessness, had forgotten to empty his pockets of various old dreams. Now, to be fair to the gentleman from Palestine, he belonged to a race that loves dreams. And to do him justice, he forgot all about the profit he was about to make of the poor poet's clothes, as he sat cross-legged on the floor and read the dreams that had fallen from the pocket of the poet's old dress suit. He read on and read on, and laughed and cried, such a curious treasure trove, such an odd medley of fairy tales and fables and poems had fallen out of the poet's pocket. And it was only later that the thought came to him that he might change from an old clothes man into a publisher of dreams. Now here are some of the dreams that fell out of the poet's pocket. End of section one. Recording by Ron Altman, Niceville, Florida.